we can hear you well. We can start. Yes, please. Very well. So, good afternoon uh, to all the people who are connected and uh, uh, listening to us. Welcome to this UNCTAD uh, 15 pre-event, uh, Trade and Gender Linkages and Analysis of Least Developed Countries. Um, today, UNCTAD, the Trade and Development Organization of the UN, is releasing a report entitled Trade and Gender Linkages, an analysis of least developed countries. This is a joint UNCTAD EIF publication, which highlights the need to put gender at the heart of recovery policies, particularly in the least developed countries. The launch of this document provides the opportunity for this high level debate on how to make uh, trade contribute to women's economic empowerment in the LDCs. Women across countries and regions uh, face many obstacles that hamper their capacity to fully benefit from international trade and more generally from their participation in the, in the economy. And the uh, current COVID pandemic has unfortunately not improved uh, their situation. On the contrary, uh, poverty is on the rise. Women have uh, seen discrimination against them uh, increased. Uh, opportunities for education, training, and skill development have diminished. Uh, these shortcomings are obviously also found in the least developed countries, but there they are magnified by persistent and acute development challenges that include high levels of poverty, deficient infrastructure, limited productive capacities, and a mostly low skilled labor forces. So the study that uh, I, uh, EIF and UNCTAD are launching today um, is also uh, the basis for an UNCTAD EIF online course on trade and gender, specifically dedicated to the LDC context. And I know that many of the participants in this course are following us today and I'd like to welcome them. Both initiatives contribute to the two organizations' ongoing efforts towards furthering gender equality, inclusive trade, and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goals 1, 5, 8, and of course, this 17. So this high-level event of today is really a target to discuss the linkages between trade policy and inclusive development. It also aims to gather new ideas, uh, lessons learned, and country perspective on these issues, which will provide useful insights for the upcoming UNCTAD 15 ministerial conference, which will have an overall debate on vulnerability and inequalities. I would like now to give you a few information about our speakers of today. There have been a few changes uh, um, from uh, what had been announced initially. We have the very great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Isabelle Durand, Acting Secretary General of UNCTAD. And I would like to remind also that this event uh, is also part of the Deputy Secretary General's a series of events called Les Huit du Mois until we get there. So welcome, uh, Acting Secretary General. Unfortunately, His Excellency, uh, Her Excellency Mrs. Filson Abdullahi, who is the Minister of Women, Children and Youth of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia cannot join us. She regrets it very much and she sends her greetings. Also, uh, Mr. Ratnakar Adhikari, the Executive Director uh, of the uh, EIF cannot join us, but we are very happy to welcome Mrs. Annette Semuwemba, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Executive Secretariat for the EIF. With us today, we also have uh, uh, Mr. Tafare Tesfaciu, who is a senior advisor with the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, a member of the UN Committee for Development Policy, and also former colleagues uh, from UNCTAD. And uh, we also have the pleasure to welcome Mrs. Mia Mikic, advisor at large of the Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade, called ARTNET and former director of the Trade, Investment and Innovation Division of the UNSCAP. A couple of uh, housekeeping points before I start giving the floor to the uh, Acting Secretary General. Um, the, the, the document that is being launched today is already available on the UNCTAD uh, website um, in English. It will be soon available also in French. Just to remind you that this event is recorded 
um, for future listening. And it's also streamed on the Facebook page of ANCTAD and we would like to welcome all the uh, uh, people who are following us on the Facebook uh, platform. We have, the, um, uh, we have to thank the interpreters. We have interpretation today. Uh, interpretation is in English and French, and you can also listen to the floor. Um, the uh, language can be chosen by each participant just by clicking on the interpretation icon on the uh, um, uh, platform uh, that we are using at the moment. We are hoping to have after the first uh, round of question and answers uh, to the um, participants, uh, we are hoping to have an exchange with participants uh, from home, from the platform. So I would like to invite everybody to write comments or questions uh, in English or French uh, on the chat uh, of the platform and we will pick it up in the second part of this event. So um, uh, we will also have a little video afterwards, I'll, I'll introduce it uh, later on. So um, with all these uh, initial uh, remarks, um, I will uh, now like to turn to the first of our speakers, uh, Isabelle Durand. Uh, as I said, Isabel is Acting Secretary General of ANCTAD, and uh, uh, we uh, have a first series of questions for you, Isabel. I'll turn to French, as uh, Isabel is votre langue. Uh, et donc, uh, je voudrais vous poser une première question. Um, la CUNSET que vous dirigez en ce moment travaille depuis plus de dix ans sur les liens entre les commerces et les genres. En fait, la, la, la conférence, la, le secrétariat de la conférence était un des pionniers à s'intéresser à ce thème, hein, vraiment un des premiers. Euh, donc, cette dernière étude que vous lancez aujourd'hui, euh, qui a été menée en coopération, comme on l'a dit, avec les cadres intégrés et renforcés, vise à analyser ces liens hein, dont on parlait, donc commerce et genre, dans les pays les moins, les moins avancés. Et, et, et les résultats de cette étude confirment, en fait, euh, l'importance de ces liens. Pourquoi vous avez décidé d'investir autant sur cet thème Quelle a été votre raison principale Isabelle. Merci, merci beaucoup pour cette question. Alors, c'est vrai que c'est pour moi l'occasion d'en poser une autre et de, de se dire, tiens, mais quelle serait ou quelle est la rationalité de se priver de la moitié de l'humanité en matière de développement durable, de développement soutenable Ça n'a aucun sens. Euh, et c'est clair que le bénéfice euh, économique humain que les femmes peuvent apporter en matière de développement social et économique est, est une évidence. Et donc, depuis plus de dix ans, la CNUSET travaille sur ces questions parce que nous pensons qu'en effet, ça n'a aucun sens de les tenir à l'écart ou de façon tout à fait informelle des bénéfices euh, du commerce. Deuxièmement, parce que euh, si on veut lutter, et c'est un, un des choix importants de la CNUSET, euh, et c'est son mandat d'ailleurs de lutter contre les inégalités, pourquoi celle-là ne serait-elle pas une inégalité que nous devons combattre avec force Et donc, ça requiert quand même des instruments particuliers parce que le commerce est, un, est une des manières, ou la manière de faire du commerce est une des façons de combattre cette inégalité en termes de genre euh, par rapport aux bénéfices du commerce. Alors, c'est vrai que depuis 2010, la CNUSET publie un certain nombre d'outils, de stratégies, d'analyses pour essayer de surmonter les obstacles pour aussi éviter la reproduction d'un modèle, parce qu'on sait bien qu'il y a aussi pas mal de stéréotypes en matière de, de genre, et donc si on veut en éviter la reproduction, il faut au maximum donner des instruments à ceux qui veulent lutter contre cette reproduction. Et enfin, le Covid-19 et ses conséquences socio-économiques ont montré, vous venez de le, de, le, de le rappeler brièvement, à quel point les femmes ont été particulièrement impactées. Elles ont été impactées à la fois parce qu'elles euh, sont dans des secteurs, euh, enfin les secteurs qui ont été les plus impactés sont des secteurs où elles sont très représentées dans les pays les moins avancés. Et je pense en particulier à l'horticulture, au commerce transfrontalier, à, à, et ça c'est surtout en Afrique, à, à toutes les questions de, enfin toutes les industries où le travail est lié à l'habillement, surtout en Asie, mais aussi le tourisme dans les pays insulaires essentiellement, mais pas seulement, qui sont, euh, où les femmes sont particulièrement concentrées, ces secteurs ont vraiment pris la crise de plein fouet, et donc il y a mille et une raisons, je dirais, de s'intéresser à cette question et d'essayer de l'adresser la, de la, de la, de convenablement. Il faut donc que nos réponses, nos solutions, soient des solutions, comme on dit, genrées, c'est-à-dire qu'elles intègrent à la fois 
pour les travailleurs et les travailleuses, mais aussi pour les petites entreprises, une action déterminée et vraiment centrée sur la question du genre ou de celles qui sont discriminées en matière de bénéfices de leur activité économique. Isabelle, merci beaucoup pour, pour cette réponse et, et effectivement ce type de réponse à, des, à, à ces questions si importantes qu'on va euh, euh, examiner aujourd'hui. But now I, I will have to switch to English again uh, because our second speaker, uh, Mrs. Annette Semouemba, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the EIF, um, is uh, next uh, in the in my line of questions. Annette, uh, welcome to this event. I would like to ask you a question about the motivation of the EIF to join forces with UNCTAD for this new study on trade and gender. And of course, also for the related online course that, as we have said, uh, has started a few days ago with almost 200 participants, it's very uh, uh, relevant and important. Um, but beyond this initiative, uh, how is uh, the um, EIF uh, as a unique global aid for trade partnership uh, dedicated, of course, to the LDCs? How is it promoting a gender responsive trade environment in, in these countries? Um, thank you very much, uh, moderator, distinguished panelists and participants. A very, very good afternoon to you all. Um, and before I uh, specifically respond, uh, to the question, I want to state that uh, on behalf of the EIF, I am very pleased uh, to join this launch today of the study and uh, the uh, corresponding uh, online course. It's been a long journey. It's been a long journey. Um, we were disrupted uh, by the COVID pandemic and our timelines were thrown off offline, but we are glad that uh, we are now and we are here and we are starting. So it's a really, really excellent moment for us and I would like to commend the UNCTAD team and the team at the EIF for the hard work and collaboration. As you said earlier, there are a number of um, uh, participants that have registered over 300, at least I learned before we joined uh, the discussion and many of them from, from the LDCs. Again, that's a very good news. It really shows how important this is uh, for the LDCs. Uh, so specifically to um, respond to, to the issue that uh, um, you just put to the fore. Uh, for the EIF, as a unique global aid for trade partnership dedicated to LDCs, this is an indication, this joint effort is an indication of our efforts on promoting gender equality and the gender responsive trade environment in the LDCs and that this is bearing fruit. And I'll shed a bit of light on some of the work that we are undertaking. Um, first and foremost, trade and gender dimension have been a cross-cutting priority for the EIF program. Over the last five years of the phase two of the program, we adopted a more targeted approach to economic empowerment of women and to gender equality as articulated in SDG five. And in this connection, we launched the Empower Women Power Trade Initiative in March 2019, aimed at improving women's participation in trade policy formulation and implementation, as well as in value chains, thus increasing decent work for women. We expect and anticipate that this initiative will transform economic lives of at least 50,000 women in the LDCs. At the foundation of this effort is the building of the evidence base. And this study. What is that? telephone, because I'm both. Sorry? Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. So I'll, I'll start again. At the foundation of this effort is the building of an evidence base to support gender sensitive policies at three EIF country specific trade studies including the DTISs, the Diagnostic Trade Integration Studies. Now, this study that we are launching is all a part of that to build the evidence base. Without the evidence, it's difficult to know which areas we need to tackle as a matter of priority. It is difficult to be able to allocate resources to those priorities that need them the most. So we are really, really pleased 
um, that uh, this study is being launched and that uh, the online training following directly as a priority from that study has also commenced. Uh, beyond building the evidence base for gender sensitive policy formulation, our work with the private sector on supply side constraints enables us with female producers, cross-border traders and exporters to build their productive capacity and ability to tap into regional and international markets. And as I mentioned earlier, our efforts are starting to bear fruit. Uh, we are in the process of publishing our 2020 annual report where we have very clear coverage of our work on empowering women. And we observe that 56% of EIF beneficiaries are women, especially in 2020, about 4,500 women from the public, private sector, and civil society in LDCs were trained in trade-related areas. Uh, these numbers have a spur effect. Um, one woman trained will train more women and we train many, many more women. Um, in addition, over 88,000 women to date have benefited from training in value chain practices. And this has improved their skill to grow their businesses and to access new markets. Moving forward, we continue to enlarge and strengthen our partnership to empower women for their active and effective participation in the digitalized economy. We need to ensure that women can benefit from digital transformation and that they are not left behind. And in this regard, we have a number of partnerships uh, with UNSCAP, um, with our ITC International Trade Center, with Fair Trade Australia and New Zealand, with the International Telecoms Union, with the East African Women in Business Platform. All of these are partners that we are working with to build digital skills for women, promote gender sensitive and climate resilient market access, and supporting women to participate in regional and global value chains. Uh, dear moderator, um, I hope that gives you a flavor of where our interest lies and um, what we are trying to do to make a difference in the lives of women, especially those in LDCs. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Executive Director. I think it's an impressive array of uh, activities that you are conducting, uh, and uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, my next interlocutor, it's uh, a pleasure to see you here at uh, this uh, this Fatsch, we call him Tess, <laughs> uh, uh, a colleague of, of many, many years in Antad, and now, as I said, senior advisor of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, and also member of the UN Committee for Development Policy. Tess, um, my first question to you would be uh, about uh, Africa in particular, uh, as we all know, Africa is home to 33 of the 46 uh, least developed countries. So it's really the continent when we speak about least developed countries. Informal cross-border trades conducted largely by vulnerable groups, in particular women, is really critical for employment creation, income generation, and, and poverty reduction in, in the African LDCs. But unfortunately, it encounters multiple binding constraints and uh, in particular, these constraints touch upon uh, women traders. So now that uh, the recently agreed and recently launched African continental free, free trade area has been acted, um, how does this uh, uh, area, the uh, FCTA uh, agreements impact cross-border uh, traders in African LDCs, in, in particular women? Do you think that this agreement addresses the issue of the gender inequality in the continent. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Really nice to see you. Uh, before answering your question, if I may, please allow me first to, to thank uh, ANCAD, particularly the acting Secretary General, Madame Isabel Dora, and um, Simonetta Zarel, the Chief of Trade and uh, Gender Section for the kind invitation and for giving me the opportunity to be part of this um, uh, special occasion and special panel. And of course, uh, also allowing me to reconnect with uh, old friends, uh, Alessandra and Mia, 
that I haven't seen for, for a long time. Um, over the years, uh, ANTAD's research and analysis on linkages between trade and gender has gained importance and wider recognition, thanks largely to the dedicated and pioneering work that uh, Simonita and her team uh, have been doing the last uh, number of years. The joint ANTAD EIF report that we're launching today will undoubtedly take ANTAD's uh, trade and gender work um, a step further and into a policy arena by helping policymakers in LDCs understand better the intrinsic link between trade and gender. Now, your question uh, has three parts, uh, three components. And in a brief time I have, let me answer each of them. The first part is indicating the importance of informal uh, cross-border trade in the African LDCs and uh, the important role of women in this, in this kind of business and the fact that they have many challenges. This is the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, now there is um, the new game in town in Africa is the uh, AFCFTA, uh, Continental Free Trade Area. And um, how will this impact uh, in informal cross-border trade and, and the women who trade uh, across the border? And the third component is, has this uh, agreement uh, taken gender into account when the agreement is there. Now, on the first one, um, as Antad and many other studies have shown, um, cross-border, uh, informal cross-border trade in African LDCs, in fact, is the largest in terms of regional trade. You know, formal trade, regional level, Africa is the lowest. Uh, now it's 18%, but until very recently, it's only about 13% of um, trade um, uh, from Africa is intra-regional, while in Europe, uh, as uh, Madame Dora would know, um, about 69 or so percent, in Asia about 58 percent, Latin America 28 percent. But in terms of informal cross-border trade, it's very large. It is estimated to be around 40 percent. And within that, the major players are women, you know, partly because in the border areas there aren't many other activities, uh, economic activities. So these uh, ladies engage in uh, trading in various markets, including across uh, the border. And so it's very important uh, source of income and livelihood for, for, for women. Um, in fact, in some uh, African LDCs, it's estimated that uh, 70 to 80 percent of the traders in the informal cross-border traders are women. So it's very significant uh, for them. Now, the main thing is uh, they face tremendous amount of challenge um, from ranging from lack of safety and security uh, when crossing a border to limited formal education. Uh, and, and this means that they, under, they don't understand the rules, lack of finance, non-transparent customs and regulations, transport problem delays in border crossing. Sometimes there are studies showing apparently seven, eight days, up to 12 days, they're waiting there for them to be processed. And then you can imagine without proper sanitation and other facilities and, and uh, abuses and harassment, there's a lot of corruption. Research has shown that bribes to custom officials uh, were crossing the border is very, very common apparently. Anyway, you, you, can, you can list it, a lot of, the challenge they face, but this is the livelihood, um, the only um, choice they have and they engage and, and uh, uh, it's important source of income for them. Now, the second part of the question is that now that African countries are moving into a free trade area uh, and uh, operationalizing it, in fact, they, they started last January, will it make a difference? Now, um, in terms of the objective of the, the Africa free trade area, uh, it's to remove tariffs and non-tariff barriers, to tariffs to zero and non-tariff barriers, and remove also border controls and, and customs procedures, and also allow free movement of persons. And the objective obviously is to create a single market like the EU type for goods and services and facilitate fr free movement of persons and, and make this Continental Free Trade Agreement as the driver of Africa's industrialization. Now, uh, admittedly, we have a long way away. You know, I mean, the, the trade protocol has been agreed 
and it's uh, beginning to be operational. And um, 37 countries have ratified it, so it started. Now the free movement protocol is a long way. Only four countries have you know, ratified it. So it's a long way uh, before it's, it becomes uh, fully, fully operational and Africa operates a free trade area. However, if it is implemented to the letter as the intention is, the vision is, it will definitely make a difference. If, for example, the border controls are removed and then customs procedures are either minimized or uh, are simplified and they're more transparent and free movement of persons is allowed, obviously um, informal uh, cross-border trade, which now consists predominantly uh, women traders will, will, uh, will be easier. So I think the answer to that part of the question is yes. And the third, very quickly part of the question is that does the agreement include consideration of gender equality uh, while they were negotiating this agreement? Um, well, there is no separate chapter on gender uh, or to that matter on informal um, cross-border trade. However, the preamble to the agreement uh, it, it contains um, explicit reference to the importance of gender equality for the development of intra-Africa trade. And moreover, there is uh, an article, I think Article 3C, which emphasizes the promotion of gender equality as one of the general objectives of AFCFTA. So on the whole, um, we hope that uh, this uh, free trade area and its full implementation will, will make uh, informal cross-border trade relatively easier for women traders. Thank you very much, Tess. And as you say, uh, thanks for underlining that there's still a long way, but it's, uh, it's encouraging that the, one of the objective was indeed uh, this uh, uh, gender issue. Um, I would li like to go to our fourth uh, and definitely last and but not least uh, uh, speaker, Ms. Uh, Mia Nikic. Uh, Mia, you are uh, advisor at large in the Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade, uh, ArtNet. But you're also former director of the Trade Investment and Innovation Division of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. So um, you have, uh, uh, of course, uh, looked at the study that UNCTAD and the EIF are launching today. And you know that it advocates for using trade policy as a tool for gender equality and women's economic empowerment. We have already discussed this a little bit uh, in, in the previous questions. Now, there is a difference between inclusive trade policy uh, and gender sensitive or, or gender responsive uh, trade policy. Uh, according to you, what are the key differences and, and why does it matter, especially for uh, LDCs? Uh, th thank you very much, Alessandra, for bringing this uh, this uh, uh, sort of issue to the to, to the floor. Uh, and uh, as uh, as other panelists, just uh, uh, let me first uh, thank uh, the uh, Madame Isabel and uh, other colleagues in Angkland for organizing this uh, this event uh, to mark the release of the study, but also to. Uh, give another opportunity to the participants of the course to hear sort of broader perspective uh, on, on the topic that, that they are studying. And I think that will sort of cue them in uh, and, and give them more um, motivation to, to explore deeper into, into the study that is available. Uh, to them. Now you raise, uh, you know, the question about the difference between inclusive trade and and uh, gender uh, responsive or woman responsive uh, trade or trade policy. And uh, for some people that may not be any difference there, I think this is one of the things where you can say that you know. Uh, uh, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> uh, but I think there is an important difference. And let me try uh, to unpack some of the elements of that, of that difference. 
Uh, first of all, inclusivity or inclusiveness uh, really became the household term um, after the global financial crisis as the inequality within the countries has been um, deepening, not only in developing countries, but also in developed countries. And so more and more uh, attention was given to the quality of growth as compared to just quantity of growth. And so the, the elements, of course, of economic activities uh, are, are also uh, related to uh, cross-border trade and investment. And so as we were talking about quality or inclusiveness uh, of, uh, of growth, uh, so the references were also starting to be made about inclusiveness of trade. And what that meant is really just talking about uh, fairness of distribution of benefits um, or, if you wish, costs of globalization that was the major uh, sort of trade was the major driver of globalization, of course, in movement of goods and services, but also including the movements of, of uh, uh, labor and, and, and capital. And so the, uh, from, from there, we, uh, we got to talk about the inclusive growth, uh, of course, as well as uh, sustainable uh, development goals, uh, from 2015 on um, as uh, a, a over encompassing sort of goal for the development uh, across uh, humanity and in particular um, also developing developing countries and many uh, many of the countries have put the initiatives such as uh, you know New Zealand, Trade for trade for all, uh, or Canadian uh, inclusive approach to to trade, and, and so many other countries that really specifically talk about uh, making trade as the economic activity benefiting all in the community, right? Um, but do we also expect that such initiatives that are very worthwhile and you know uh, not not a second to to uh, you know too early um do we expect that they will deliver also what we understand as a woman economic empowerment? Uh, do we expect that these uh, broad initiatives talking about inclusive growth that have many dimensions, including, uh, you know, of course, they mention women, but they mention other marginalized or underrepresented uh, segments of societies. Uh, they're also looking at uh, geography aspect. They're looking at social uh, strata aspect, uh, ethnicity and so on. Will they deliver when we talk about a woman empowerment to trade policies, the trade policies that are actually negotiated at different levels, as it was recognized already by previous speakers, right, through the free trade agreements, um, through unilateral changes in trade policies, such as increasing tariffs, uh, in you know, putting in place non-tariff measures, various standards, uh, also, you know, safeguards, etc., or at the negotiation table at the World Trade Organization. And so uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, you know, they may, but they may not, because unless we see um, the, 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 the woman empowerment as a specific goal, of the of the trade policy uh, mentioned and actually formulated and having uh, specific targets, uh, it it may be that we are aiming too high with the inclusive uh, uh, in uh, in initiatives and not really delivering for women. Um, and one of the one of the examples. Let me give you a few examples. Like we um, we have always. Um, or, or in many cases, until recently, just treated trade policy as gender neutral. And so if you do not specifically say that trade policy is not gender neutral, that it does have differential impact on women and men, right? It may be that uh, as it is implemented, formulated, designed, it's not going to actually benefit. It may benefit all and the average, but it's not necessarily going to be benefiting women specifically, 
right? And so, um, uh, you know, uh, like in ESCAP, for example, we are in, uh, in a, we are lead agency for the uh, overall UN global survey for uh, implementation of trade facilitation uh, measures that, that include dozens of measures. And so we are, uh, 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 as, as it happens with all the measures that have more than one indicator, you sort of aggregate them across many dimensions and then you rank countries and you met you you um monitor them over time. So what, what you then get is, for example, a country may be performing and even improving its position on the rank across the overall index of the performance in trade facilitation. But because that index is a composite index that uh, includes uh, many and uh, measures for the improvement of uh, women is only one. It actually may be performing well on the average, but not specifically for the woman. So it's very important to have specifics in mind. And that comes to force, uh, I think, through the COVID situation um, uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, and uh, let me finish with that, uh, 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 just also uh, you know, reminding of what our Secretary General was talking um, in, in several occasions, is that uh, all the all the sort of uh, stimuli packages and um, and uh, 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 policy instruments that are put in place during the early stages of, of Pacific, they were using the language of inclusiveness, but very few had actually very specifically targeted women. And we can actually number uh, 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 countries in, in minority that had uh, took effort to really put in place policies, uh, not including trade policies for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, looking at the businesses and, and um, um, a woman's role in, in those uh, across the border um, that would help such 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 businesses and uh, the the importance for LDCs in this context is that as they uh, and I come from Asia where the uh, while we have uh, the most LDCs in Africa a uh, very large percentage of Asian LDCs are actually looking into um, a sort of graduation in, in, uh, in the next uh, five to six years. And so they need to worry about how they will put in place policies that will actually uh, steer uh, uh, all the forces in their economies towards contributing to, to, to high quality economic growth. And so that therefore, uh, women uh, empowerment needs to be addressed uh, more directly rather than to, through just a very broad inclusiveness growth. Uh, sorry for this long winded answer, but I, uh, it, it's a difficult question to actually answer very, very, you know, quickly. <laughs> No, no worries. I think you have answered uh, very comprehensively. And I think it's important what you said about the importance for countries to walk the talk is, is more than just the uh, generic uh, reference. So absolutely. And uh, thank you very much for, for reminding us of this. Uh, before I, I turn to Isabelle Durand for our second uh, round of questions, I just would like to answer uh, one of the questions that came into the chat about the recording, yes indeed, for everybody, uh, so that you all know, the recording will be made available after the event on the UNCTAD uh, platform, so uh, you will be able to come back to it uh, if needed. Isabelle, uh, je reviens à vous avec uh, la première des questions uh, pour, les, pour ces secondes uh, round. En fait, uh, là je voudrais toucher à, à un secteur spécifique qui a été analysé dans l'étude que vous avez publiée, qui est, est l'agriculture. Euh, l'étude a vu, a, a, a bien expliqué que les femmes représentent plus de 40% de l'emploi total dans l'agriculture dans les PMA. C'est énorme, 40%. Et il a aussi montré que, que cet engagement dans, dans le secteur agricole investit surtout l'agriculture de subsistance, donc vraiment euh, une agriculture euh, non, non euh, euh, industrialisée, non commercialisée. Mais cette transition doit se faire. Et donc la question que, que j'aimerais bien vous poser, c'est quels sont les défis 
que la transition de cette agriculture de subsistance vers la commercialisation, vers les exportations agricoles, vont poser aux femmes et éventuellement, quelles mesures pourraient être mises en place pour assurer que les femmes bénéficient euh, de cette transition autant que les hommes dans les Oui, mais merci euh, Alexandra. Et c'est vrai que l'étude met un chiffre que, que nous supposions, mais qui est très important, 40% des emplois, euh, d'ailleurs souvent dans l'informel, dans le secteur informel, dans l'agriculture, dans les PMA, ce sont des femmes. Et c'est vrai que le passage d'une agriculture de subsistance à une agriculture un peu plus commercialisée, plus lucrative, aussi plus rentable, est un passage compliqué. Pourquoi Parce qu'on constate qu'à chaque fois qu'une entreprise agricole passe de la subsistance à quelque chose d'un peu plus lucratif et rentable, elle est reprise par les hommes. Et donc, immédiatement, quand le secteur se commercialise, quand on envisage l'exportation, quand les revenus augmentent, par exemple au Sénégal, où les femmes sont surtout actives dans l'horticulture, et elles sont dans la production, mais elles n'ont aucun pouvoir sur les revenus. Les paiements sont enregistrés par les hommes et donc elles sont simplement, je dirais, les, les petites mains, euh, mais jamais associées à euh, ce qui constitue la capacité d'augmenter une activité commerciale et donc de pouvoir augmenter ses revenus et, et, et entre autres d'ailleurs la question des paiements. Donc, d'ailleurs, il n'y a pas que le secteur agricole dans lequel c'est comme ça. Je signale que dans beaucoup d'autres secteurs, y compris d'ailleurs hors des PMA, quand une activité devient rentable et qu'elle est portée par les femmes, elle devient masculine. Euh, c'est presque une règle du jeu et c'est une règle qu'il faut changer. Alors, c'est vrai aussi qu'il y a euh, un certain nombre de traditions ou de normes sociales qui peuvent expliquer pourquoi euh, ces secteurs sont surtout occupés par les femmes et qu'elles ne parviennent pas à, à, à passer dans la transition. Par exemple, en Tanzanie, la tradition de la période coloniale veut qu'il euh, n'y ait pas de culture de thé pour les petites exploitations. Or, les femmes sont dans les petites exploitations, donc par définition, elles sont exclues euh, de ce secteur. En outre, on le sait évidemment, les femmes portent, en particulier dans les PMA, mais pas seulement, le gros des activités domestiques. Et donc, ça, ça décourage évidemment de se lancer dans une activité un peu plus euh, complexe ou un peu plus euh, importante. Donc, c'est important que euh, dans les, les réponses que l'on essaye d'apporter, on puisse faire une vraie analyse de genre et des programmes tout à fait ciblés sur le renforcement de capacité, sur les chaînes de valeur euh, agricoles, de manière à justement répondre à ce problème des femmes qui sont cantonnées dans la production de l'agriculture de, de subsistance, ni plus ni moins. Il s'agit aussi que nous puissions travailler sur euh, des modalités, par exemple, de financement, de soutien à, à faire grandir des petites entreprises de subsistance, à pouvoir aussi faire du, men, du mentoring, du mentorat, euh, avec des femmes qui peuvent, qui ont tout à fait la capacité de passer de la subsistance à autre chose. Et puis, il y a un autre aspect qui est évidemment très problématique aussi, qui est celui du régime foncier. Beaucoup de femmes ne sont pas propriétaires ou n'ont pas accès, ni d'ailleurs par héritage, euh, à, à la terre. Euh, et donc, ça limite évidemment leur capacité à devenir les, les product, non seulement les productrices, mais aussi euh, les, les, les propriétaires et donc celles qui orientent euh, le devenir de leur entreprise agricole. Et j'ai constaté d'ailleurs que même dans des pays où on a changé la loi sur le régime foncier pour permettre aux femmes d'avoir accès par héritage à la terre, la tradition est parfois plus forte que la loi. Et donc, on n'applique pas la loi parce que la tradition est plus forte. Donc ça, c'est quelque chose, évidemment, qui est un, qui est un problème et qui n'est pas facile à, à, à modifier. Il ne suffit pas de changer la loi pour, pour croire qu'elle est appliquée. Enfin, il y a tous les problèmes aussi de certification. Et je, je, nous avons fait à la CNUSET un, un travail avec euh, Fairtrade International. Et quand on regarde euh, les entreprises Fairtrade, qui sont généralement des entreprises coopératives, on se rend compte que la, la division du travail est beaucoup plus équitable et que spontanément, sans quota, on arrive à 50% de femmes dans le pouvoir de décision de la coopérative, dans la définition du prix, dans l'organisation et la division du travail. Et donc, c'est assez intéressant de se dire que là où on travaille sur une base coopérative de commerce équitable, spontanément et sans mesure particulière, les femmes sont légales des hommes au niveau de, de, de la décision. C'est quelque chose qu'on doit regarder en tête. Enfin, Tess vient de parler très très bien de l'accord de, de libre-échange, la zone de libre-échange africaine. Et donc c'est vrai que c'est un énorme enjeu qu'à travers cet accord de libre-échange, on ne puisse pas seulement avoir 
un petit chapitre euh, ou un, un, un article dans le, dans le traité, mais que cet article dans le traité se traduise par des politiques concrètes. On le voit par exemple dans un certain nombre d'accords de, 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 de libre-échange entre l'Union européenne et certaines régions du monde. De plus en plus, on intègre ici ou là un chapitre sur le genre. Mais bon, intégrer un chapitre sur le genre, c'est bien. Avoir des mesures, des statistiques, des chiffres et un contrôle sur l'application de ce chapitre, ça c'est autre chose. Et c'est là qu'on peut avoir un réel effet, c'est quand le chapitre ou la prise en considération va plus loin et se traduit par des mesures tout à fait ciblées, secteur par secteur, en particulier, comme vous m'interrogiez là-dessus, sur le secteur agricole. Merci Isabelle. Effectivement, c'est très intéressant que vous soulignez euh, déjà, plusieurs choses dans ce que vous avez dit elles sont, elles sont extrêmement intéressantes, mais que vous soulignez la, la, la corrélation quasiment naturelle entre ce qui est coopératif, ce qui est fair, ce qui est juste, équitable, et l'avancement des femmes, c'est -ce quand même quelque chose d'assez important. Et puis l'importance, et je pense que Mia le disait aussi, euh, évidemment Tess aussi, de, la, de faire un suivi qui est bien euh, sectoriel, bien identifiable, euh, sur les problèmes en faveur des femmes. Et puis Isabelle, merci d'avoir rappelé que les femmes, eh bien, les obstacles au, à, à, pour l'avancement pour des femmes, elles ne sont pas juste d'ordre, des, 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 disons, sociétal, mais aussi personnel. Et, et quand il s'agit de s'occuper des enfants, d'avoir de, de, des problèmes de, de tâches domestiques, etc., il faut un soutien des pouvoirs publics. Autrement, autrement les femmes ne peuvent pas... Ils ne peuvent pas avancer dans ce sens-là et, et merci de nous l'avoir rappelé. Et, et là, je repasse en anglais, I turn to English again and, and to Annette again. Annette, the, the uh, uh, study has highlighted many of these difficulties and I think Isabelle has mentioned uh, quite a few uh, and not only in the agricultural field, but in general. Now, uh, in order to uh, uh, promote Uh, women's economic empowerment in the LDCs. What challenges did you did you face? And maybe if you could give us some examples, some some solutions, concrete solutions, uh, uh, maybe adopted by some of the countries that you've been working with, that could inspire other countries to do the same uh, and to have positive results. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And indeed, um, uh, Isabel and, and Tess have. Um, touched on a, a number of issues around the key challenges. And so I will perhaps identify only uh, another one or two. And uh, for us as a program working in a partnership um, to influence change of women in LDCs, one of the main challenges that we found, and we also found this challenge as we designed the Empowerment Power Trade Initiative, was the lack of gender disaggregated data. It seems like a minor issue, but it's a very, very important a challenge. If we don't have data, we don't know that the intervention we are designing or that the solution that we are putting forward will actually address uh, the challenges. Some of the data that is available is very broad and general. It doesn't really say much about, uh, for instance, certain policies and how they impact men and women. It doesn't, they don't uh, indicate how uh, women economic empowerment can be promoted within um, uh, the policies that are in place. And so for us, that has been and uh, remains a, a major challenge. And one also that has been raised by other partners uh, such as the uh, World Bank. Um, we continue to focus on this and to help promote um, studies and analytical work that helps us to obtain uh, this uh, data. So again, uh, I think Ongtad and the EIF are on the right path Uh, in terms of the analytical work that has been commissioned. That's exactly uh, one of the solutions that we see as most ideal, put in place the evidence and use that evidence uh, for policy uh, formulation, for policy change, uh, for engagement uh, with the governments uh, through a public-private um, approach. Another challenge we found, and I think uh, Isabel has uh, alluded to this as well, is the inadequate participation of women in decision-making policies. Um, we do have a number of um, committees that we've established. These are mainstreamed in the ministries of trade. Um, they are meant to uh, engage between the private sector and the public sector towards uh, trade policies that are conducive 
um, for, for trade, for, for, for women, for competitiveness. However, in our observation, many of these discussions will be skewed because there's insufficient participation by the women. And there are many reasons for this. Um, many times the women either are engaged in other activities to be able uh, to participate effectively. They are, we, we had already their involvement in uh, activities at the farm level, sometimes that don't allow them uh, to rise above their number of associations that have been formed. And so for us, again, another solution is to help uh, the women uh, collect, to help the women come together through associations. Because through these associations, one, they provide a platform for training, but to they identify champions, which champions can participate in these processes uh, for uh, public-private uh, uh, discussions and engagement, processes for trying to ensure that uh, policies reflect uh, the needs of women. Is in this many of the uh, happening in uh, some specific countries? Yes, I am coming to an example. I'm coming to an example right now. Um, and I'll give the example of uh, Lao PDR. There are many, many more examples uh, that I could share. Uh, but in Lao PDR, we have a project uh, that um, is on promotion of export competitiveness in three northern uh, pro provinces. And we have created production partnership groups. I think that's an important word, production partnership groups that link hundreds of women household producers of handicrafts, tea, maize, rice to value chains. So rather than the women struggling on their own, uh, these women are working through these groups and collectively trying to reach the market and in these very, very um, selected uh, areas. Uh, this is leading to increased productivity and export performance uh, in this key agribusiness area in the poor areas. In terms of how exactly this is done, um, there's a register of each and every woman who belongs to one of the production partnership groups. It is clear what that um, uh, particular participant in the group is producing, what quantities, when are they expected, uh, what kind of skills do they have, what kind of skills do they need, and timetables are drawn up for training around uh, these needs that have been identified. The women handhold each other and do not leave each other behind to ensure that uh, they can collectively meet the needs um, that um, they might have obtained uh, from a market access opportunity. So that's a typical example of the work that we are doing. I'll give another example. Uh, in South Sudan and Uganda, the women involved in share butter have also been organized in cooperatives. Now, this is a new sector in Northern Uganda and so the South of South Sudan. It's a new sector. And so the need is great in terms of helping the women articulate the policy related issues as they relate to the shia sector uh, for these two countries. And so again, women have been organized to work together in cooperatives, one with leaders that are advocating for policies that are conducive for the shia sector, but two, to ensure that they have voice in discussions that are happening at a national level. So those are two examples and there are many more um, that we could share. Um, I hope that uh, again helps everybody understand what how the EIF works in terms of um, addressing some of these challenges. Thank you very much. Thanks for these examples. Um, I'd like now to go to Tess again and to ask you a, a question that relates to your uh, qualification test as uh, the member of, as one of the members of the UN Committee for Development Policies. This committee actually frequently meets and one of the things that you do in this committee, which is extremely important, is to discuss and upgrade the criteria that countries have to meet for either inclusion or to into or for, for graduating from the LDC category. So the question to you in the framework of our discussion of today, in your opinion, has adequate attention uh, been paid to the gender and gender equality related issues in determining the criteria for the uh, LDC graduation? Is that something that you're looking at? And maybe if I could just say, 
to everybody if we could have a little bit shorter uh, answers uh, because I would really like to go to the question in the chat but there are very very good questions and I would like to ask them to you in the second part of this uh, of this event Tess sorry okay a short answer will be in my opinion and as a member of CDP yes educate attention has been paid uh, <coughs> to gender gender equality related uh, issues again very uh, quickly um, since uh, the creation, the establishment of um, LDC category, um, that's when CDP was created, 1971. And it was actually created as expert group to identify the criteria for identifying countries that will be included in the LDC category. And at that time, they identified three um, uh, indicators, uh, GDP per capita income uh, of $100 or less, an adult literacy rate of 20% or less, and a share of manufacturing total GDP of 10% or less. So at that time, the gender issue didn't really come into the picture. But of course, over the years, the last five decades, the um, um, uh, criteria indicators, have they have evolved. They have changed and CDP is constantly discussing. And of course, in all these efforts, uh, what Annette was saying is uh, very important. In all these efforts, the problem is identifying indicators where the data, the data is found, can be obtained where in all countries, where all countries are regularly updating data and it's available. That is the problem, um, identifying um, in indicators. I remember some five, six years ago going to Comoros and we were really, I don't know whether to say surprised, but at that time, they had only four qualified statisticians in the whole country. This is Comoros. And, and um, um, I really felt that uh, uh, among LDCs, that, that's one country where really even less than other LDCs in terms of availability of um, human resources and, and so on. So data is a problem. But coming uh, yes, back. Sorry if I interrupt you, just but on this particular point, do you think that, I mean, you are pointing out in the, to uh, the problem of finding the correct, uh, uh, reliable data, but is this even more difficult when it comes to women or to gender disaggregation, or it's it's a general problem? Is well, that something that you should it's look It's more? a general problem, actually. It's a general problem, but uh, more so when you want uh, data that is disaggregating on in gender, even more so, but general uh, problem. Uh, but to, to answer your question, at the moment, there are three sets of criteria to decide which country should graduate. One of them is on income. The second one is human asset development. The third one is on economic and environmental uh, vulnerability. So I'm not going to go through the 15 indicators, but let me focus on uh, two of them. Um, the gender related indicators, there are two of them, and they focus on the human asset development side. Uh, one of them is on health aspect. On health, there are three indicators, under five mortality rate, prevalence of stunting, malnutrition, and the third one, maternal mortality rate, ratio, sorry. Now that one is, is defined in terms of the number of women who die from pregnancy related causes, while pregnant or within 42 days of pregnancy termination per 1,000 live births during given time period. That's the definition of um, this maternal mortality ratio. That is used in, by CDP as one of the uh, indicator. And this is important because it captures both the broader development handicaps in terms of health, such as poor development health systems, but also gender inequality. Uh, secondly, the data is available and on uh, maternal mortality ratio. Um, it's regularly reported uh, by the Maternal Mortality Estimation Interagency Group and the WHO, MMEIG, they are called. So because available, um, they, they use it. Now, the second indicator that uh, CDP uses, which is relevant for gender, comes on the education side. On education, there are three indicators. The uh, CDP uses. One is gross secondary school enrollment ratio. The second one is adult literacy ratio, uh, rate, sorry, adult literacy rate. And the third one, and this is where the gender dimension comes, is gender parity index for gross 
secondary school enrollment. And the CDP is using this because again, the data is collected regularly by UNESCO, it's available. Um, it measures the ratio of girls to boys enrolled in secondary education. Um, it also addresses inequality in education uh, and can also have a long-term negative impact, which ha can have negative impact on sustainable development. Um, it's, as I said, collected by UNESCO. So with these two indicators, uh, the gender uh, equality or inequality aspect is taken into consideration when the index is lo looked at to decide which country should graduate or which countries cannot graduate because they haven't met the criteria. So you are doing a good job <laughs> in this I sense. I don't know about no, a good job. No, but just <laughs> joking, but I mean, it's, it, it's something that is it's coming out through, yes. maybe through uh, other indicators that are not necessarily yeah. Uh, gender gender specific, but they give you a, yeah. a fantastic indication on that. Yeah. That's uh, a very, very uh, interesting uh, element that you're adding here. Thank you very much, uh, Tess. Um, Mia, um, one of the issues that uh, is evidently uh, hampering uh, women's economic development is access uh, to finance. That's not just developing uh, countries, it's also developed countries in a in a, a, a lot of circumstances. Um, can I ask you, what do you think is the role of uh, the technology developments in improving this access, access in particular, uh, if you look at the Asia and Pacific uh, region, especially the LDCs, what, what progress, if any, had been, has been done? Uh, thank you very much for bringing uh, another big topic to the conversation, but I am very much aware of the time, so I'm not going to go into nitty gritty of that. Uh, just to confirm that, yes, indeed, this is the problem that uh, women uh, led enterprises and medium and small size enterprises across uh, the globe are facing, in particular, you know, after uh, the uh, the conventional uh, financing sector has been there risking from uh, sort of uh, financing th these type of uh, small scale operations and uh, for some reason even though it's not supported by evidence uh, they still consider uh, women run businesses as very risky and uh, and because of its smallness they are not willing to actually engage in 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 that way so uh, it's very important to find alternative ways uh, to provide uh, uh, sources of financing for women-led businesses. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to inform that ESCAP has been um, partnering with the uh, Canadian government and with some uh, uh, with UNCDF and with some other private uh, sector partners in really looking at how to bring innovative financing to the women-led businesses in particular with uh, you know some LDCs but also some developing developing countries and this is really to remove the obstacles that uh, that um, normally um, exist uh, to make uh, the the financial services available affordable convenient easy to use etc and therefore in our project we are also not only um, really putting in place financing channels, and I'll tell you very briefly one example, but also um, uh, also the, the, the two other arms of the projects are uh, capacity building for women in terms, in terms of uh, co a computer financial um, IT literacy, as well as working with policy regulators, uh, because that part needs to be also tackled in order to really make innovative financing working. And so the part of innovative financing, because there are many aspects, but one is really uh, very important and it's using this digital technology. So it's about digital, um, di digital financial services that bring um, so many benefits uh, to, to women because it really removes uh, the, uh, for example, through enabling electronic ID or uh, creating the history of uh, of uh, of business uh, and therefore the uh, the the financial sort of credibility, uh, removing uh, removing the obstacles of not having titles uh, to get the lending, uh, peer to peer lending, crowdsourcing, etc. All of this is opened up 
by uh, just having the access of digital uh, digital uh, technology uh, uh, for for women. Now, of course, there are uh, there is there is still this big problem of digital divide. That is, uh, we all talk about gendered digital divide because we all know that um, uh, women are less likely to to be in ownership of the of the uh, medium that would bring them to internet or have a um, have access to digital uh, services. There is a problem of uh, lack of, of knowledge, etc. But uh, with the common sort of effort, we are working re working on that, and it's it's not when we are working with these uh, sort of very clear objective for helping women and give them access to finance. Um, what we have discovered is also that initiatives that we have um, we have funded um, actually help a, a much many more than than just women. Uh, and I'll just give you one example in Samoa, for example. Um, we have uh, worked with the with the private sector partner that aimed to uh, bring the digital platform uh, to the island um, uh, called Maua application so that it would allow electronic commerce, etc. What they faced then is the obstacle of not having uh, one uh, interoperable uh, e-payment system because it didn't. There were four commercial banks in the island on the islands, and that they, they were not talking to each other. So what we uh, through our project, uh, you know, uh, uh, facilitated was really a, a development of a new application that became uh, not only island specific but also went across the border to allow e-payments. And many women that were engaged on the platform and were able to actually work through the platform um, benefited uh, through that. But not only that, them, but uh, also other businesses, their families, and there are spillover effects from that because we know as women earn, uh, they, they, um, they spend differently. And, and so it's, it's very important to continue investing, investing in that. Let me stop there. I hope there will be questions on digital uh, financial services services because it's a very important and um, and uh, uh, I think interesting topic to to bring more examples uh, from from Bangladesh and other countries indeed th th there are many interesting questions in the in the chat and in the uh, Q a uh, sector so I, I, I'm gonna go to that in, in a moment but thank you for for your answer Mia uh, Isabelle uh, j'aimerais bien revenir à un aspect qui me paraît très intéressant euh, de, euh, on a parlé beaucoup d'indices, on a beaucoup parlé de, de, de classification, etc. En fait, si on regarde certains PMA, je mentionne entre autres les, les Burundi, l'Éthiopie, les Rwanda, euh, on va écouter quelqu'un du Rwanda tout à l'heure, euh, ils obtiennent ces pays des, des classements bien meilleurs quand on, on regarde l'indice d'inégalité de, 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 en fait, des, des genres que l'indice de développement humain. Donc, on, on, se, on se pose la question, en fait, si au-delà de la capacité économique intrinsèque d'un pays, la volonté et, et, et de la, des politiques, en fait, d'améliorer euh, euh, l'égalité des sexes, c'est vraiment étroitement lié. Euh, donc, euh, je voudrais vous demander, euh, qu'est-ce que vous en pensez de ces résultats qui, qui sortent bien hein, de, de l'étude que vous lancez aujourd'hui et, et en plus, peut-être encadrer euh, votre, votre réponse dans, les, dans la prochaine conférence ministérielle de la CUNICED et, et de l'initiative que, que vous avez lancée des huit du mois. Vous êtes, vous êtes sous mute. Pardon, voilà. Parfait. Oui, donc, donc euh, il est tout à fait vrai qu'on peut faire tous les calculs économiques que l'on veut euh, et essayer d'améliorer les, les, les instruments économiques, y compris, comme ça vient d'être dit, euh, les, les, les solutions de paiement, les plateformes, etc. S'il n'y a pas aussi euh, une volonté politique suffisante, je pense que les efforts ou les succès seront euh, tout à fait en deçà de ce qu'ils doivent être. Et donc, comment est-ce qu'on améliore la volonté politique d'un gouvernement de travailler sur ce sujet Je pense que, bon, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, il y a des stéréotypes et des traditions qui, 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 sont, qui existent, mais ce qui est important, c'est que nous, les Nations Unies, nous, la QCET, nous puissions aussi mettre en évidence 
l'intérêt et l'importance pour l'économie, pour le, 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 la relance post-Covid, euh, que les femmes puissent être actives et puissent contribuer au bénéfice global du pays, pas seulement à leur bénéfice à elles, mais au bénéfice global. Et c'est d'autant plus, comme ça a été dit, que les femmes dépensent différemment et que quand elles sont des acteurs économiques avec une activité rentable, leur euh, investissement, entre guillemets, va être un investissement dans la communauté, euh, dans la communauté immédiate pour euh, des soins de santé, pour euh, des choses qui touchent à la vie quotidienne et qui donc, elles aussi, améliorent, je dirais, le, 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 les autres, d'autres euh, ODD ou d'autres éléments euh, euh, dans la communauté. Alors, c'est vrai que l'indice de développement humain est intéressant en ce sens parce qu'il intègre d'autres types d'indicateurs, euh, les critères santé, éducation, revenus par habitant, alors, c'est vrai que ce, ce, cet indice de développement humain, il est plus élevé dans les pays euh, insulaires et asiatiques, mais il faut quand même reconnaître que l'étude le montre que dans les pays africains, les PMA africains, euh, ça s'est quand même amélioré. Donc, il faut travailler cette volonté politique de façon euh, puissante, forte. Et c'est pourquoi nous mettrons cette question du genre aussi au cœur de la conférence de la CNU 715 qui se tiendra en octobre au Barbade. C'est pourquoi nous avons lancé cette initiative les 8 du mois, puisque les 8, le 8 mars, tout le monde fait sa petite déclaration sur le genre, les femmes, etc., ou les droits des femmes. Et puis, quand le 9 mars est passé, on attend l'année suivante. Bon, donc, nous, on, a, on décide chaque mois d'avoir une activité spécifique ou une information ou un soutien à des politiques de genre. Euh, mais aussi, euh, je pense qu'il est important de donner de la visibilisation aux femmes, aux femmes qui réussissent, mais à toutes les femmes. Euh, et donc, en ce sens, je pense que les success stories des femmes ne sont pas assez visibles. Euh, nous avons par exemple pris des initiatives sur euh, le mentorat euh, des femmes en matière de, de commerce électronique avec des, des, des femmes qui sont des mentors. On en a une par région qui font des, des, des animations et des masterclass avec les femmes et où on montre euh, des exemples de femmes qui réussissent et qui réussissent dans des secteurs parfois tout à fait inattendus, euh, et c'est très important. Et enfin, euh, dans le cas de la CNU 715, euh, vous savez que les Caraïbes sont une région du monde où, paradoxalement, je ne veux pas dire qu'on a du matriarcat, mais enfin, on a, les femmes sont beaucoup plus omniprésentes à tous les niveaux. Et la question, parce que j'ai vu que dans le chat, certains posaient la question, est-ce que le genre, ce n'est pas aussi la question des hommes Oui, bien sûr, sauf que dans l'immense majorité des cas, le retard est quand même le retard des femmes, mais à certains endroits du monde, et singulièrement dans les Caraïbes, c'est souvent, des, les, les femmes sont à tous les postes de commande et on a vraiment un problème avec la génération des jeunes garçons. Les jeunes garçons sont dans la criminalité, enfin, pas tous évidemment, mais sont tentés par la criminalité, l'absence de perspective, etc. Et les femmes occupe tous les postes, ou à peu près. Et donc, on doit là aussi euh, travailler dans l'autre sens pour pouvoir, je dirais, donner aux garçons, aux jeunes garçons, des perspectives euh, de, de, de faire partie de la société, faire partie de l'économie, euh, augmenter leur capacité de revenus, etc., etc. Donc, oui, la volonté politique est clé. La CNUSET s'engage depuis longtemps et continuera de s'engager dans ce sens. Je pense d'ailleurs qu'en principe, nous devrions avoir une nouvelle secrétaire générale d'ici peu. Je m'en réjouis et je pense que pour en avoir déjà parlé avec elle, elle est tout aussi motivée que moi à faire de cette question, pas seulement parce que nous sommes des femmes, mais parce que nous pensons que c'est quelque chose qui est bon pour le développement et bon pour l'économie pour de ces pays dans le cadre du post-Covid. Donc, on continuera et on a un forum genre qui durera trois jours en préambule de la conférence de manière à permettre aux femmes et aux hommes d'exprimer leur point de vue et leurs revendications ou leurs attentes qu'on enverra bien sûr au ministre lors de la conférence elle-même. Donc oui, le chantier est loin d'être terminé et la volonté politique, ça se travaille. Et c'est une ancienne ministre qui vous le dit. Donc ça se travaille et il faut organiser la pression autour des décideurs parce que sans pression, il n'y a pas beaucoup de motivation à réellement avancer. Merci beaucoup Isabelle. On suivra la conférence avec uh, grand intérêt. Maintenant, je vais. Now I'm going to um, uh, take advantage of my position of moderator 
to um, really ask you for a, for a big effort. I'm, I've got a, a one question each for the other three panelists, but it's very late and we have extremely interesting questions in the, in the chat. So I will ask you the question, but I would like to ask you if you can to answer with one sentence. Is that something that we could try? And, and then we will go to the questions. So Annette, just really one question, one answer, one sentence, if you can. According to you, how we further advance in the important journey towards gender equality through trade policy? One answer, please. Thank you. Let us harness strategic partnerships. Let us harness the strengths in the different organizations and work together. Great. That, that is, I think, a very, very insightful answer. Tess, same, same thing for you. Uh, just one answer. Um, we've seen LDC's integration into the international trading system. Has it contributed to gender equality, particularly the narrowing of income gap? Um, it has enabled the, it has provided opportunities for women, yes, integration, but uh, no, it has not narrowed the income gap or uh, improved the gender inequality, in my opinion. That's a very sound opinion, I believe. And thank you for this very quick answer. And Mia, uh, I come to you with a, a, a last uh, uh, point. Um, the, there's a huge difference between the number, the, the percentage of world population that lives in the LDCs and the production of, of uh, GDP by this country. It goes from 13% of the world population to 1.2 only percent of the world's GDP and only 1.2% of total world trade in goods and services. So just very quickly, do you think that a more active participation of women in the economy and in trade more specifically could help improve this situation? Let me, uh, let me be very, very brief. Um, putting women to work and increasing their participation in the economy is smart economics, smart business, smart politics, and smart governance. And uh, I can expand on that, but in the interest of time, I will not. I would really hope that we would have more time to go a little bit into deeper details, but maybe in the answer to the questions, you'll be able to give uh, a few insights. So um, uh, we are going to go now into the chat, into the answer uh, to the questions. And then at the end, if we have time, we will show the video that came from us from uh, Rwanda. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. So if I go to the questions, um, we, Isabella has, uh, has spotted the issue of uh, women and uh, and, and men uh, uh, in the uh, in the in the chat. This is something that I think is is quite interesting, uh, and I'd like to ask it to our only male uh, uh, panelist. Uh, it's a very pro provocative question. Test the, the the gentleman. Oh, I don't know if in fact it's a gentleman or, 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 or a, a lady. Misia Lomo is asking. Uh, we haven't heard about men. Are men not relevant in trade and gender topics? And obviously she, she or he meant uh, uh, to refer to initiatives for men to ensure that gender is well integrated in trade or trade benefits for all. And I guess meaning with gender, both men and women. Tess, let me ask yeah. you this question. Well, I, I think we, we, we're giving a special emphasis to trade and gender, uh, especially women and trade issue because men are already um, excessively represented in gender, I mean, in trade, sorry. So when we're talking about um, trade from countries in terms of entrepreneurs, uh, in terms of um, who participates in global value chains, in terms of um, managing the logistics and so on, men are predominantly um, represented than women. And I think, the, as, as we indicated with um, informal cross-border trade, the uh, challenges facing women are excessive, be it in finance, be it somebody raised the collateral issue, for example, which is a challenge in terms of uh, access to land. Uh, Isabel was raising a number of important issues, both in the uh, agriculture, but either is by law or by custom, uh, women are disadvantaged. And trade, 
we keep telling LDCs is very important. Integration to international drainage system is very important for their growth, for their development. And that's why they're being encouraged to go for export uh, led industrialization. That's why international support measures like duty free quota free market access, uh, special differential treatment, WTO, and what Annette and her team are doing excellent job with EIF. Uh, helping countries to build their uh, capacity is to enable them to integrate to, with, with uh, international uh, the trading system. But the, the problem is women are disadvantaged uh, excessively uh, when we look at who benefits from this trade. That's why it's not because uh, men will be uh, are not relevant or ignored. Mm -hmm. It's just simply that uh, women are having the really the rough end of this um, um, process, that's why. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, I think also Mia answered this uh, question in the chat, and Mr. Mrs. Lomo said uh, um, was, was speaking about the fact that men could also serve as change agents to empower women. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here, which is a, a very interesting, I think. Um, I don't know who want to pick it up. Maybe maybe Mia, I don't know, or Isabel. Um, this person who is not signing says, what advice would one give to an LDC government, so the political power, that would like to raise labor standards for women when we know that um, investments would likely move to another country where these standards are lower, which means also lower costs. Who would like to pick this up? Maybe Mia, you or Isabel? Well, I can, I, I, I can, I can yes. start and Isabel can then add on to that. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, when the government changes standards uh, related to labor, it's not for women only, it's across the board. So it applies to labor market in general. And then um, what we have seen based on the empirical evidence is that actually investment doesn't react uh, to, to, to these uh, sort of drivers um, and they look for more uh, for, for uh, overall uh, enabling policies uh, to, to pick uh, up attractive locations rather than uh, labor standards. And so we, have, we haven't noticed, at least not in Asia, um, any, uh, any dislocation or uh, relocation of investment as a response to changes in, in labor standards. Plus also investments of today are very much uh, aware of uh, what their um, consumers um, want and uh, the behavior on the, on the consumer side, side is such that would make um, uh, uh, not in their favor to actually chase the, the low, uh, low standard labor, labor standards anymore. Oui, si je peux ajouter, oui, bien sûr, bien sûr, je, peux ajouter ça, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec ce que vient de dire Mia, et j'ajoute que c'est souvent un argument qui est utilisé euh, par un gouvernement, pas seulement d'ailleurs euh, pour la question du genre, c'est aussi le cas par exemple, ou la question des conditions de travail, c'est aussi le cas par exemple en matière d'environnement, dès qu'on met en évidence un problème environnemental que pourrait, qui pourrait être la conséquence d'un investissement, immédiatement on dit ah, « si on ne le fait pas, ils iront ailleurs, dans le pays d'à côté ». Donc deux réponses à ça, la première c'est l'importance d'avoir une intégration régionale et d'essayer que les questions soient traitées pas pays par pays, mais de façon plus globale pour éviter, je dirais, les, les, les avantages comparatifs ou les, 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 les comparaisons. Et deuxièmement, ne pas se laisser impressionner par des arguments qui ne sont pas de vrais arguments. Et je suis d'accord avec Mia, ce n'est pas nécessairement cette question-là qui va déterminer complètement euh, le, le choix d'un investisseur. Ce n'est pas vrai. Euh, D'autant plus qu'il euh, est bien connu que le travail des femmes et quand les, les, ou le, le gender balance dans le travail va amener justement une meilleure productivité. Et donc, je pense que ce n'est pas un bon argument et qu'il faut le, ne pas le croire et le réfuter. Merci pour cette précision, Isabelle. En effet. Et, et, et puisque vous parliez de, de, de questions de, de green economy, hein, d'investissement dans, dans la green economy, il y a une question de Prashant Sharma, um, uh, and it's in English, and maybe Isabel, you want to, to, to also... Also in English, this, yeah. or, or, or Mia. 
Worldwide COVID-19 recovery and response strategies put a broader emphasis on a green, inclusive and climate resilient pathway, tells us Sharma. As terms inclusive and gender sensitive are not necessarily related, where do we stand in terms of advocating for a gender aware pathway to accelerate the positive impact of the broader focus? And he gives an example, for example, by highlighting direct or indirect dividends of women economic, economic empowerment for a green, inclusive and climate resilient transition. Who would like to, to answer this very interesting question? Isabel? I can start and Otto can complete, of course, just to say that um, I think that um, there is, of course, no objective link between gender and uh, um, climate or environmental development. Nevertheless, uh, I'm totally sure that, yes, women and women in a government or women at the decision table are more inclined to integrate environmental and long-term or sustainable issues because it touch, it could touch really concretely the community. So I think that it's not true that there is no, of course, no objective link, but there is a link between the two. And I, I think that doing something which is more balanced regarding gender could help to have answer, political answer, which are more adapted to what we have to all of us uh, that we have to address. It means uh, climate and environmental and, and nature issue if we would like to survive on this planet on long term. So I'm sure that the, that gen, there is a kind of indirect link between gender and, and uh, uh, environmental or capacity to, to be up to have a green, also a green recovery and not only a recovery as such. In, indeed, Mia, maybe you want to complete on this because you have uh, really, yeah, go, go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah. Yes, if I may, and that would yes. link to my, to my, you know, um, women empowerment, being smart, economic business, et cetera, et cetera, because what we find is that, that really um, involving women in decision-making and in policy-making makes uh, a more stable, a less risky uh, and more inclusive uh, policies, right? And so what we are lacking at present is really the sufficient number of women sitting at the table and making these decisions. And so we have to, you know, um, really celebrate those countries and those corporations and those initiatives that, that put women in place of making these decisions. Plus also the governments that really take responsibility when they create their budgets to put gender budgeting in place that would take into account then spending towards green, inclusive, et cetera, uh, very clearly. And I think that would go a long way in recovery policies as well, right? So, so uh, let, let me stop there to give chance to others to add to it. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I just wanted to say it's uh, two minutes to four. If everybody agrees, uh, because there are so many interesting questions in the in the chat, would you be available? I, I would continue a little bit. Maybe we can uh, uh, have a little bit more conversation uh, for those who can stay with us. And Annette, there is a question for you, I believe. I mean, maybe you want to take it up uh, from Jane Korinek. Um, she's asking, to what extent can Aid for Trade initiatives help small women traders and business owners access the markets and if you have any specific example it's short to answer please um thank you yes a very important question and one that uh, requires um time if i'm to give a really good examples because we have a number of them yes um small women traders and business owners have access to markets um we've um looked at um opportunities for small businesses and small traders and also looked at challenges for small businesses, because challenges for small businesses differ from challenges for bigger business. And so um, putting in place a program that focuses on these women, as I said, through cooperatives, for example, um, we have lots of examples in West Africa along uh, specific value chains like Mango Value Chain, Share Value Chain, Sesame, all these um, sectors employ uh, small um, uh, women, tra women traders, and uh, business owners as well. We also have lots of cooperation with uh, ITC. I don't know, Jen, if you're familiar uh, with the work of uh, She Trades, but uh, we work closely with uh, the She Trades program. And we have a number of good examples where women have accessed international markets uh, in honey, in apparel, in uh, handicrafts, uh, simply 
by making sure we give them the right skills and we accord them those opportunities to access the markets through exposure opportunities, bringing them experts to help them develop their skill. So yes, there are um, lots of examples and uh, I can confirm because there are many uh, positive um, examples of aid for trade indeed contributing to market access opportunities. I'm happy to um, take a discussion on the side with Jen um, so that um, I, I could elaborate more if she's interested. Thank you very much, Annette. Uh, and I really hope that this conversation can continue so that we can have more information. But I'd like to thank the interpreters who have just said that they can uh, bear with us a little bit more. Uh, Tess, I, I have two questions that uh, would be uh, really uh, for you. And uh, they are not connected, but if you don't mind, I'll ask them both so you can give us maybe a, a short answer to each one. Um, Ziad Amui is asking, uh, can we, I think it's a very interesting way of putting this, can we collectively shift the mindset from trade with Africa to trade across Africa? And to that effect, how can we build gender inclusive policies to help trade across African borders? This would be a first question for you. And a second one, uh, which I would also like to ask you uh, rapidly, comes from Monica Vega, who is uh, uh, reaching to us from the Gender and Development Department of the Ministry of Industry and Commerce in the Dominican Republic. Um, she says, we have trade in the border with IET, but still struggling with our women citizens, providing them tools as educational and financial support. And we do face problem, I mentioned before by you, uh, on the lack of segregated data. Any suggestion towards regulating the trade with IET? Thank you, Tess. Thank you. Well, very uh, quickly. Um, Yes, uh, actually the Intra-Africa Trade or the AFCFTA is an effort belatedly in Africa to increase trade among African countries rather than trade between African countries and the rest of the world. Because uh, as I said, Intra-Africa Trade is the lowest of any region. Um, it's only now it's reaching around 17, 18%. Otherwise, uh, it was really hovering around 12, 11%. That means most African countries do not trade with each other. They trade with the rest of the world because they are exporters of commodity, uh, uh, like uh, mineral products and agricultural products. They export to the rest of the world rather than with each other. So the whole idea of the AFCFTA is to increase intra-Africa trade, i.e. Africa trading within itself. So, that is a move and, and uh, I think it will help with manufacturing industrialization because when you look at that small trade between African countries, 47% is in manufacturers, which means that when African countries trade with each other, they tend to trade more in manufactured products. Therefore, there is hope that this AFCFTA will encourage industrialization. Now on the second uh, question, Dominican Rep uh, Republic Haiti, I think one uh, thing I could mention is that the possibility of having uh, within the border um, expert processing zones or some kind of industrial parks that will bring the uh, comparative advantages of Dominican Republic and the comparative advantages of Haiti, which is in terms of having a labor force that is uh, cost lower or cheaper than the, the, the wage paid in Dominican Republic, perhaps having um, zones, uh, processing zones around the border could uh, accommodate uh, and employ women in particular since a lot of, uh, of these industrial processing zones tend to employ women because they have lower wages, which is irony of it. Indeed. Thank you very much, Tess. You've been extremely concise and interesting. Um, uh, maybe for Mia, uh, you have been speaking about uh, the issues related to the financial uh, uh, difficulties for women. Um, there is a question from ASU Gachira, um, uh, who is asking, what about issues of collaterals when we talk about financing system? She or he thinks that the issue of collaterals is one of the problems that women face. It is indeed, and uh, but it's more present really in the in the conventional financial sectors where you have banks operating uh, with very sort of historically made 
set up and trying to to seek securitization through these collaterals and then of course women don't have titles on the property and don't have um, all sorts of access to uh, to to a property rights that would be able to put um, them in a position to use those as uh, as collaterals against the, the loans, right? However, in innovative financing, and in particular with uh, the with usage of these uh, digital uh, financial services, we can create the business history of women small businesses that can be used as a digital asset, as a collateral. So when, when the woman is, for example, operating um, by using digital financial services, it, um, the, the platform memorizes the number of transactions and the value of revenue, et cetera, that that business is making. And so that woman then can take that particular evidence and go to even the conventional uh, sort of uh, com uh, commercial uh, financing source like a bank and say, my business is viable. I can actually repay this loan based on my history. Right, and and so this is what innovative approaches and using technology allows us, um, as as compared to the conventional one. Of course, uh, the other problem is uh, uh, is national uh, laws and regulations. We have to change the position of women in the economy and give them the the rightful ownership over over properties, inheritance laws and all the other things that would put them on the equal footing with men uh, so that they can actually, even in the, in the conventional uh, uh, commercial financial uh, uh, system, they can uh, benefit uh, from, from that. So reform uh, and, uh, of, of national systems in terms of treatment of women in, uh, with respect to ownership of properties is required as well. Thank you very much. Um, Isabel, uh, there are two suggestions. I think they're interesting in the, in the chat for you. Uh, in the, uh, en plus de, de vous féliciter pour avoir introduit des questions sur les femmes sur la conférence de, dans la conférence de, de, de la commissaire de la, la 15e conférence, euh, on, nous, on vous suggère de renforcer la collaboration avec ONU Femmes pour les concepts HE4 je pense que c'est he for she, euh, même si c'est écrit en français, qui sensibilise et donne de la visibilité aux hommes euh, pour soutenir l'égalité dans tous les secteurs de l'activité. Et puis, je, je trouve que euh, cette question qui est bien, tout, toutes ces questions qui nous viennent de Yvonne Moyou Tagne, euh, elle, elle a une petite suggestion pour vous, et ce serait que les sessions sur les femmes ne soient plus exclusivement traitées en side events lors des grandes conférences internationales comme la CNESET 15. Vous êtes, vous êtes euh, euh, les, les microphones. Ah, pardon. Donc, je réponds tout de suite sur la dernière question parce que ce n'est pas un side event, c'est un forum, un vrai forum. Et deuxièmement, vous devez savoir que euh, la conférence se tiendra virtuellement, bien sûr, au Barbade, donc virtuel Barbade, que la première ministre est une femme, que la secrétaire générale sera une femme, que euh, moi-même, je, je, je suis une femme, et que ce sera au cœur de la conférence. Donc, ce n'est pas un petit side event avant pour occuper les femmes en attendant et puis de passer aux choses sérieuses avec que des hommes. Donc ça, je rassure tout de suite, ce n'est absolument pas la stratégie, notre stratégie à la CNUSET pour la conférence elle-même. Euh, quant à ce qui est dit sur la collaboration avec euh, ONU Femmes, d'abord on a beaucoup de collaboration avec eux, en particulier sur Genera Generation Equality, qui est un nouveau concept qu'a lancé euh, UN Women de manière à pouvoir rassembler toutes les initiatives euh, touchant à l'égalité des genres. Et euh, he for she, oui, c'est vrai qu'on euh, a besoin des hommes pour avancer sur la question du genre. On a besoin que les hommes portent cette question avec nous, Tess l'a très bien dit, euh, même s'il y a évidemment un retard du côté des femmes. Et je, je voudrais juste vous raconter une petite anecdote, parce qu'elle est parlante, euh, même au cabinet de Obama, qui était pourtant, je dirais, un, premier, un, un président assez ouvert à la question euh, du, du genre, dans son cabinet, les femmes utilisaient des hommes, et elles appelaient cette stratégie l'amplification, 
pour pouvoir porter leurs idées. Cette idée était d'abord portée par un homme pour qu'elle puisse être ensuite récupérée par la femme qu'il avait initiée, parce qu'elle était mieux entendue qu elle, quand elle venait d'un homme. C'est une toute petite euh, illustration du fait qu'on a besoin évidemment d'hommes qui portent avec nous euh, la question de l'équilibre des genres et que euh, leur manière à eux de pouvoir porter cette question sera une contribution euh, incontestable. Euh, l'affaire du genre n'est pas l'affaire des femmes. C'est pour les femmes, mais c'est l'affaire de tous. Absolument, absolument. Je vois Annette, uh, I, I see Annette that you are exchanging with Jane Korinek to go deeper in, in the question that she asked and, and that is very uh, nice. Uh, maybe for you very quickly, Annette, in, in all the uh, various uh, activities that you are Uh, implementing. Maybe you can give an answer to Mamadou Aliou Diallo uh, from Guinea. Uh, he's saying it's taking a very good example of uh, an African woman, um, not educated, uh, having more than five children living in the countryside. How can you help uh, her, this, you know, woman uh, to, to develop her, uh, um, her economy, uh, economic uh, uh, situation. And uh, uh, maybe in general, uh, he says, um, maybe this is, would be for Tess, uh, who, what do you think of the weak representative TV, sorry, weak representativity of women in the um, sub-Saharan public administrations? So maybe I start with Annette. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, from where I sit in Geneva, it's uh, very difficult to work with uh, individual women. There's lots of them that uh, need the support. And that's why we work through the Ministry of Trade to make sure that the Ministry of Trade then works through associations and women um, groupings to make sure that uh, women are reached uh, as far as they are. And we're trying to uh, take that level down to also local governments. So the ministries of trade working also at the local level and are collaborating to make sure we can include as many women as possible. Uh, it's really difficult. The women that need support are very many. Um, we have a very few pairs of hands and that's why we take pride in working with the ministries of trade. The ministries of trade do have these mechanisms uh, within their uh, structures to reach as many women as possible. So. I would um, maybe make those connections and linkages and afford them that voice uh, through their associations or even directly, um, we can make those connections most definitely. Thank you very much, Annette. And Tess? Um, yes, well, it's true that in public administration in Sub-Saharan Africa, generally women are, are not represented, but I think we should also recognize that the change is happening Uh, slowly, as more and more girls uh, go to school and graduate, go to university, we're beginning to see uh, more and more women in uh, public positions. And some countries like Rwanda and Ethiopia uh, are setting examples by having, for example, in Ethiopia, half of uh, all the ministers, half of them are women. It's very symbolic and uh, shows that uh, uh, women can. Uh, uh, against the established cultural view that it demonstrates that women can actually take um, high level positions and do a good job. In fact, they perform better than, than men. So I think it's changing, but um, the, the question now is right, that uh, until now, uh, public administration is not represented very much by women. And also when you have uh, in some countries and LD, African LDCs, Ethiopia being a good example, about 80% of the population is still in rural area where access to education is limited and cultural constraints are heavy. It's very difficult to find women being uh, represented in the public administration level, but it's changing. Yes, since I've got you uh, uh, there, just very quickly, uh, there is a question from Yasmin Ismail, uh, who is saying, uh, I'd like to ask about conducting ex ante and ex post gender impact assessment of trade agreements. And he's referring in particular to the uh, 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 AFC, uh, AFT, 
Africa. Africa. Yeah. Exactly, Africa, exactly. Is that uh, this kind of assessment being considered? Well, not to my knowledge at the moment. As I said, that there is no separate chapter within the agreement um, or protocol to that matter on gender uh, issue. As for example, Isabel was saying in the European Union, um, it's, uh, there is a, a specific chapter and the role of women is recognized as uh, an integral part of that agreement, but not in AFCFTA. But as I said, it is recognized in the preamble and also Article 3C uh, does emphasize uh, the role of women in the development of intra-Africa trade, whether this is just simply a token um, measure, I don't know, but there is no chapter or protocol yet on gender specific. Maybe it will be considered in the yeah. future. Um, uh, sorry, I know Isabel and Annette had uh, to leave us. I have one more question for Mia, and I'd like to show you a, a short video that has been sent to us. I think, to I think is Isabel wants to say something. Yeah, before, but before <laughs> doing that, I would like to just give the floor to Isabel and Annette for their uh, final word. Yeah. Uh, and then I go to the last question to Mia. Isabel. Non, je, euh, my final word, euh, mon, enfin, mon, mon dernier mot peut être une réponse d'ailleurs à ce que vient de dire Tess. Euh, je pense que c'est évidemment important de placer la question du genre dans les préambules, dans les textes, etc. Mais la question concrète qui a été posée, à savoir il faut avoir quelque chose ex ante, et quelque chose ex post, est très important. Euh, il faut avoir à un moment donné plus que des déclarations, il faut avoir des mesures ciblées euh, qui sont identifiées Il faut pour bien faire des données qui permettent mmh. des agrégés par genre, qui permettent de mesurer les efforts, sans quoi on va se contenter de petits chapitres qui seront rarement réellement appliqués et qui donneront bonne conscience à ceux qui pensent que c'est que c'est une bonne chose. Ce n'est pas suffisant, ce n'est pas une question de bonne conscience, c'est une question d'égalité, c'est une question d'un point de vue économique qui est bonne pour le développement de tous. Donc il nous faut de l'ex-ante et de l'ex-post, de l'assessment des projets ciblés et un travail continu. Je remercie toutes ceux, toutes ceux et toutes celles qui ont pris part à ce, à, ce, à, à ce webinaire, parce que je pense que si chacun d'entre eux peut déjà, à son niveau, essayer de faire avancer quelques-unes des idées qui ont été évoquées, ça nous aidera à rendre la question un peu plus concrète et à faire avancer le dossier plus solidement. On a besoin aussi de la société civile et de tous les acteurs pour faire bouger les lignes. Merci beaucoup Isabelle et, et vraiment de nouveau merci pour avoir été avec nous si if you and 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 I have to leave uh, we would understand um, uh, and I would thank you uh, already for having been with us uh, Mia if I can ask you the last question and then we will go to the video and then we will close there are two uh, uh, um, issues uh, raised by Singh Vilai Olai Van and it's about Laos Lao PDR. Uh, he says interest rate in Lao PDR is 3% per month. It's too high. How women smallholder can access to finance in Lao? In fact, afterwards, he says the lowest interest rate is 6% 6 per, 6 per year for promoting SME fund, SMEs funded by Ministry of Industry and Commerce via, via commercial banks, but difficult to access. So if you could just maybe... Uh, ac ac thank you very much, Alessandra. I, I, I actually will engage with that uh, participant uh, separately as well, because there is an issue about verifying the data as well. Uh, and, 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 and I think uh, the information I have is uh, slightly different. But the, the, okay. the, the, the fact remains that uh, the, the, ec the amount of uh, financing is still restricted. And so uh, definitely uh, it's, uh, it's an issue and uh, hopefully we can work on that. Uh, uh, and if I just may to add to what uh, Isabel also said very, uh, uh, very eloquently about the the impact assessment uh, for FTA, as, as we all now uh, start working on that through the WTO and new working program, uh, informal program on, on, on women and, or, or gender and trade, we are trying to put uh, more sort of pressure on the member states to really um, engage in impact assessment uh, with the gender gender lens and the good news for participants in the course is that one of the essays 
uh, probably uh, that they will be uh, working on will will have elements of on that. So they will be able to practice and uh, and and learn more more about that. Absolutely. And on this word, maybe Annette, I know that you will also have to leave us. Maybe you want to have a, a final word, uh, especially with reference to the course, as Mia said. Um, yeah, my final word. Um, and I was really thinking about um, the impact of the work that we are doing, all of us collectively. We are all involved in our various um, interventions. All of them are aimed at uh, addressing challenges faced by women. We are all looking at uh, improving the lives of women. And I really think we need a very good program to assess the impact of what we're doing and to learn uh, from that work. Are we really creating the difference that we'd like to see? Is this the best that we can do? And every day there's a new program coming up, looking at the same challenges and trying to address uh, concerns that we hear uh, from the ground uh, by the women. We need also to take a step back and I'm really hoping the next conversation uh, with this study and with the training having been undertaken, let's sit back and reflect. Did it deliver the impact? Did this training lead to policy formulation processes at country level changing so that more women are benefiting? For me, I think, and as I listened in, it's a, a reflection that came to my mind. Um, and of course, um, uh, with the uh, uh, continental free trade area, there's a huge opportunity there. And I'm glad we have an expert with us, uh, Tess, who will take back our views so that um, through that framework, again, there's a program designed specifically for women. So those are my final thoughts. Uh, thank you so much, moderator. It was a real pleasure uh, participating in this conversation. Pleasure was ours. Thank you very, very much. And um, in fact, I, you, you've spoken about the course. I would like now to just show a very short uh, um, video and very short uh, uh, message that comes to us from Ildefonso Musafiri, who is the executive director of the Strategy and Policy Council in the office of the president of Rwanda. Um, Ildefons uh, participated in the online course on trade and gender devoted to stakeholders from COMESA um, a couple of years ago. And he is currently enrolled in the ongoing course that we have mentioned on several occasions um, for LDC's uh, stakeholders. So he would just give us a, a short insight on the usefulness of um, the course in his role uh, as executive director. Uh, it's very short and then we will conclude the uh, um, event. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Let me first and foremost congratulate the conveners of this launch and commend the existing exciting report on trade and gender leakages with the analysis of least developed countries. I'm Dr. Idefonso Musafiri. I have a PhD in economics. I work as a executive director of the Strategy and the Policy Council of the President of the Republic of Rwanda. I'm happy to join you today and thank Mrs. Simonetta for allowing me to make a special intervention as the former participant of ANCTAD module on, trade, on gender and trade linkages devoted to commercial countries. ANCTAD online models on gender are very commendable. Little is known about gender and especially its linkages to trade. Personally, I live in a country that has a very visionary leader, President uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame, who has put gender mainstreaming at the center of his development agenda. Those who have heard about Rwanda facts can speak for themselves we have more than 64% of female in the parliament and the cabinet members, more than 50% are women. Even the constitution of the Republic of Rwanda stresses on gender equality by conferring at least 30% of positions to women in all decision-making organs. So this has resulted in a significant improvement of women representation in the government, parliament, judiciary, and the private sector. As a strategic advisor, I decided to join this course because I needed more resources and knowledge 
to support implementation of national priorities and thanks to unexpected models that made this dream become a reality. So these models provide a clear understanding of gender mainstreaming, especially in trade. At a personal level, this has impacted my work in three ways. First, the model confers a clear understanding with the new lenses. People, people can see with the new lenses um, when you are looking at a trade. For me, when I look at trade policies, including policies on the tariff, agriculture policies, policies to cross-border trade, finance, promotion of micro-enterprises, manufacturing, and many other sectors uh, in our economy that are heavily dominated by women. So I have a new lens now. I can look at them and fight and advocate to solve gender gaps that are visible in these particular sections of, of the economy, which are dominated by women. Second, these models conferred me a holistic approach to gender gap issues. So you look at both at producers, consumers, and other sides of economies. So where you have gender gaps in many aspects of the day life, even in health. Third, these models have conferred me, have inspired me on new research agenda. I didn't mention it previously, but I'm also a senior lecturer and researcher at the University of Rwanda, and I'm working for more evidences to orient our gender policies. So, for example, I've started to analyze the performance of female-headed companies, and I want to compare them with the men-headed companies to see which one performs better. Then I, I want to come up with um, a clear cut to see uh, where we can put more effort in appointing managers uh, of, of or government agencies. Second, I also uh, I want to look at uh, the factors that determine the involvement in cross-border trade, factors affecting uh, small-scale agriculture because we have a lot of female uh, in small-scale farming. I want also to look at the factors that uh, affect involvement in formal sector. I want also to look at the analysis of salary gaps because among between men and women, because I want to get good insights to orient gender policies in the next future. And I'm keen to identify key areas where we lag behind in promoting gender equality and suggest collective actions. Based on the good path experience from the first model, I also applied to join the second one on ADCs. And I'm looking forward to deepen my knowledge with the clear case studies which good lessons from our comparable countries that can be replicated in Rwanda. And I'm sure good cases will be there where we can learn and deepen my analysis and be able to serve better in my advisory roles. It's unfortunate that I can't be with you to discuss more on the topic, but Rwanda is a very ambitious nation with the bold thinking, with accountable institutions, and all based on our unity and dignity values. I hope the participants will have a chance to visit Rwanda and we can discuss more on how we can move from the third world to first world with the gender lenses. I thank you for your attention and wish you very fruitful deliberations. I would like to um, thank you all. Uh, Mia, uh, Tess, is there any, any very, very last word you want to say or can I conclude here? I Just see simply say thank talking. you. Exactly. This is the, the, <laughs> the best part, and it's uh, for the moderator to say thank you to everybody. We have been having uh, uh, more than 100 people connected only on the webinar um, from the beginning to the end of this event. As you've seen, we were you know, even unable to conclude in the, in the time uh, allocated because of the many, many interesting questions and discussion. I'd like to thank all the, the, the speakers. Uh, of course, also the people that are following us on Facebook. And I'd like to thank the person who is behind the organization of this uh, webinar of the course and of the study, who is Simonetta Zarilli, uh, who is the chief of the Trade and Gender Program in ANCTAD. Thank you very much, Simonetta, for organizing this uh, very, very interesting event. Thanks to in the interpreters who have been with us, uh, with us uh, until now. 
and thanks to the uh, IT team who has allowed the technical part of uh, this uh, event. So I really hope that this discussion will continue in the months uh, that are going to um, run now until the 15th UNCTAD conference and that all the participants in the course will find it very useful and interesting and take benefit from it in their daily work. Thank you to everybody. Uh, and I really hope to see you in another event very, very soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.